Have you ever thought to yourself, there has to be more than this? Why does it seem like life has a way of making us feel less? Not just feel like less, but feel less, as in numb, leaving us to wonder if this is it. Is this all that life has for us? We spend every day just trying to make it from one item on our calendar to the next, from one email to the next, from one soul-crushing moment to the next. Was this God's plan? Is there more to life than this? What if God really does have more for us? More love, more joy, more peace, more purpose, more hope. What if God is the God of more? And what if the life we've been searching for is freely found as we surrender our lives more and more to Jesus? Because Jesus is offering us a way to live life that is more than we've ever even dreamed of. We are Altitude Church. We are here to help you become more like Jesus. So, what are you becoming? Welcome to Altitude Church. We're so glad you joined us online. This week, we are starting our brand new series, So Will I. It's a little bit about Jesus and what he does, and if he can do it, then so will I. If you're a first time guest here with Altitude, we would love to have you get a hold of us so that we can donate $5 towards the battle against sex trafficking. And we do that for each of our new guests. Here at Altitude Church, we have so many ministries that we're working on, and it's because of your giving that that happens. So if you would like to give to Altitude Church or continue giving to Altitude Church, please visit our website for more information. Today is Communion Sunday, and we would love to have you be a part of our communion together. So go to your kitchen, grab something that resembles bread or crackers, and grab something that resembles juice. And after today's sermon, we will gather together, and we would love to have you be a part of that. Thanks so much for being a part of Altitude Online. And now join us for an amazing time of worship. Jesus, you 
Creation is a gift from God, and the talent or the ability to create something such as a painting or a song, I believe comes from God. And those of you who like to create, whether it's a drawing or a craft or something you build, you know that it begins with an idea or a thought. We sometimes call this a vision. The vision at Altitude Church is to make a difference in our community by sharing with hundreds of people how to become more like Jesus. I know that this is a big vision, but God is a very big God. My journey with this vision began with prayer. It was about eight years ago, God laid upon my heart for this small church in the Arvada community that I had relatively no connection to at all. I had no idea where this would take me, but every day, I drove by the church on my way to work. I was reminded to pray. After about two years of praying, God spoke to my heart through some very unique circumstances, and he said to me, don't hesitate. The next day on Sunday morning, I went to the Arvada Church of God, and I met with one of the leaders. And I told him, I says, hey, I think God wants me to come over here and help. And about six months later, I was called to be the pastor at this church. After about three years of pastoring and praying, God began to speak to me again about the new path for this church. And again, I had no idea where we were going. But after about another year of prayer, God brought Pastor Lee and myself together. I believe that uh, we are the instruments of God's hands for him to use in the creation of something new and fresh and good something way beyond what we could possibly imagine or hope for. As the vision continued to unfold, God opened the way for our two churches to come together for a shared vision of what we could be and how we could impact our community. The vision at Altitude Church is about reaching hundreds of people so that they may know God and discover a genuine purpose in their life through serving others. When I look back on my journey, I can see how God directed my path, but it was a walk of faith and trust in God. I believe that if you allow God to work in your life like a brush in the hand of an artist, God can create something beautiful to make an impact in our community. As we move forward with the vision to reach our community, I would like to invite you to share it in this journey with us. There are three ways that you can be involved. The first one is to pray. Pray for the ministry of Altitude Church and the impact on our community. Pray for the lives to be changed as we become more like Jesus. The second way is to give. I encourage you to support the ministry and the outreach of Altitude Church. You know, your gift can make a significant difference in the life of someone else. The third way is to join the launch team. Join us on this faith journey as we help equip you to serve others and make an impact on our community, one person at a time. If you're interested in joining us, contact me and I would love to sit down and have a conversation about our vision 
at Altitude Church. Good morning. I'm Ron Olson, one of the pastors here at Altitude Church, and I'm excited about launching our, our church uh, this fall in a new venue and with a new focus on ministry and outreach. You know, our core values for this new ministry are very simple. Know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. Now, most of you, if not all of you, would agree that it's important and perhaps vital that we have purpose for life. You know, life without purpose is chaos. It makes no sense, and it's meaningless. So as human beings, we find purpose for our life. We set goals, we endeavor to achieve something, or we accumulate things. You know, hopefully, the purpose that you seek is something good and worthwhile. Something that's outside yourself. Now, as I think through my, my own life and, and the many things that I have sought after, such as material objects, achievements, relationships, honestly, most of those things were self-centered. And, it, and in the end, those kind of things will not satisfy what is missing in your life. They didn't me. Now, I believe that the ultimate purpose in life is to glorify God. And you may ask, what does that mean, to glorify God? Well, it means to honor God by loving and serving him in everything that you do. To acknowledge that he is God and our creator. And to know that we belong to him. Now, I believe that the Apostle John, also known as the beloved disciple of Jesus, gives us some insight as to what this means in one of his letters in the New Testament. 1 John chapter 3 uh, verses 1 and 3 says this, See what great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know Him. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as he is pure. See, we are God's children. We were created by him, and it has been revealed to us that we belong to him. But not everyone recognizes this relationship because not everyone believes in God. Not everyone trusts in God. You see, God created us with the ability to choose for ourselves. Now, when I was about 10 years old, I watched this movie on TV called First Men in the Moon. And the film was based on this book by H.G. Wells of the same title, First Men in the Moon. And the story was set in the Victorian era uh, at the end of the 19th century, where a British uh, scientist named Joseph Cavar invents this substance. And when it's applied to an object, it reacts against the force of gravity. It was kind of like an anti-gravity anti paint. So Joseph builds a spherical spaceship by which he intends to travel to the moon with his partner, Arnold Bedford. And unexpectedly, a, a woman named Kate ends up going with them. And, uh, on this sci-fi adventure, uh, you know, they encounter the usual things, right? The, the large insect-like creatures, and the other dangers. It was quite the journey. Now, the movie was produced in 1964, five years before we actually stepped on the moon. And back then, going to the moon was more, more of a dream or a fantasy than a, than a reality to many people. And I just remember how this movie made me uh, feel. It, it made an impact on me. And I was very fascinated with it. But I'm not sure I believed that we could really go to the moon, uh, as some of them you know, did at that time. You know, in the late 1950s and early 60s, we were in a race with the Soviet Union to reach outer space. And we were losing, convinced of the political need for achievement, which 
would uh, demonstrate America's space dominance, uh, President Kennedy asked his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, uh, to uh, identify such an achievement. He specifically asked him to uh, investigate whether the United States could beat the Russians in putting a laboratory in space or orbiting uh, around the moon or landing a man on the moon and to find out what such a project would cost. And Johnson, well, he consulted the officials at NASA and he was told that there was no chance of beating the Russians to launching a space station. And it was unclear to whether NASA could orbit a man around the moon first. So the best option would be to attempt to land a man on the moon. So Kennedy, he stood before Congress on May 25th, 1961 and proposed that the U.S. Uh, should commit him, itself to achieving the goal before the decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Now, not everyone was impressed or believed we should, you know, um, or even could. You know, a Gallup poll indicated that 58% of Americans were opposed to the idea. Now, the point I want to make is that not everyone believed. Not everyone believed that we, we could go to the moon. And, and after Neil Armstrong landed on the moon in July 1969, some people still didn't believe it happened. You know, they thought it was a fabrication made on a movie set, a fantasy. In fact, some people still don't believe today that we landed on the moon. See, people believe what they want to believe regardless of the truth, because we have the ability to choose what we believe. What do you believe? What do you believe in? What, do you, what or who do you place your trust in? And why? Now, that is what I want to explore with you today and, and see what God has to say about it in the scriptures. Now, if we would turn, uh, if you would turn to your Bible in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, uh, we're going to begin with verse 37. John 12, 37 says, Even though he, meaning Jesus, had performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe in him. See, Jesus was in Jerusalem, and it was during Passover. See, this is a week-long festival where the Jews would flock to the city to celebrate the deliverance uh, from their bondage to Egypt. You might remember the story, or at least remember the movie, The Ten Commandments, of how you know, God delivered uh, the Hebrew people from the servitude of Pharaoh by the hand of Moses. It was through the miracles of God that he brought them out of Egypt. So every year, the Jew, Jewish people would um, remember what God did, and, and they would celebrate that. See, Jesus was at this festival teaching and healing the people. And even though he had performed so many signs, so many miracles in their presence, they did not believe in him. They did not believe that he was the Messiah or the one who would deliver them from their bondage. Most of them did not understand or believe that they were in bondage, bondage to sin and evil. Now John tells us that this was expected, that they would not believe. It was written long ago by the prophet Isaiah the people would reject Jesus. We find that in verse 38 and through 41. It says this, This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, who said, Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This is why they were unable to believe, because Isaiah also said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes or understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke about him. This particular scripture is confusing to many people, and I can certainly understand that confusion because I have wrestled with this scripture myself. Why would a loving God blind the eyes of the people and harden their hearts? The people were disobedient to God by refusing to believe in his son, and his, re and his response, God's response, seems to be, anger, and punishment. But this is not what God is expressing at all. See, the Apostle Paul uh, states that God's severity towards disobedience 
his judgment of sin, even his willingness to blind the eyes and harden the hearts of the disobedient are expressions of a more fundamental quality of God, that of mercy, which is an expression of his purifying love. According to Paul, therefore, God is always and everywhere merciful. But we sometimes experience his mercy or, or his purifying love as severity or judgment or punishment. When we live a life of obedience, we experience his mercy as kindness. But when we live a life of disobedience, we experience it as severity. Let's continue on in John verse 42. It says, nevertheless, many did believe in him, even among the rulers. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, so they would not be banned from the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. There were many who did not believe in Jesus as the one they called the Messiah or the, the anointed one of God. But there were many who did. However, they were not willing to confess their belief because they were divided in their heart. They loved human praise more than the praise from God. Did you know that God gives you praise when you're obedient to him? That is what a good father does for his children. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, a voice was heard from the heavens. And God said, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We are also God's children if we believe and trust in him. And he's, his desire is to praise us. Now, these next few verses in John are key to understanding the scope and the purpose and the focus of God's plan for our lives. Verse 44 says, Jesus cried out, the one who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And the one who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and doesn't, doesn't keep them, I do not judge him for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has this as his judge. The word I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command to say everything I have said. I know that his command is eternal life. So the things that I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. We all have choices in life what to believe, what not to believe, what we will do and not do. And Jesus had a choice as well. See, God sent his beloved son to the world to die for you and me. That was God's plan for his children to be redeemed and reconciled back to our relationship with him. But Jesus, and Jesus made this possible when he died on the cross. But this plan was not forced upon him. See, he humbled himself and gave himself freely for us. And yet he still wrestled with, it, with that choice. See, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in just a few days following this discourse, Jesus would be praying to God. And he asked him to take this cup away, meaning the physical and the emotional suffering and the agony that he was about to go through. And yet this was God's will. So Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. He said this because he trusted his heavenly father with this plan. Now, some people did not believe in Jesus. They rejected him as the Messiah or Savior. Others believed, but did not put, his, put their trust in him. They were afraid to let go of the things of this world. And there were those who, who believed and trusted in Jesus. And some of these people later on would give their life for Jesus. Now Jesus shared with us the truth of God's plan for salvation and reconciliation. And he trusted God for this plan. And Jesus is inviting us 
to trust also in this plan. So I have three questions to ask that will help us understand God's plan. The first question is, what is the scope of this plan? Jesus said in verses 44 and 45, the one who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And the one who sees me sees him who sent me. Now, the scope of this plan, or our belief in Jesus, encompasses everything that we see and touch. If you believe in Jesus as the Son of God, as he claimed he was, then you believe in God, the creator of everything. And if you see Jesus with your spiritual eyes, then you see God because they are one. This means that everything that we do and all the decisions in life that we make will be done according to our belief in God. For example, if I believe in Jesus, then I also trust in him to take care of me. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? And then in verse 33, he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Seeking the kingdom of God first is trusting in the plan God has for you. Now, Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. See, we are his creation. We are the children of God and we belong to Christ Jesus and everything that we do will reflect his glory if we believe and trust in Jesus. The second question is, what is the purpose of this plan? Now, Jesus said in verse 46, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. Now, the purpose of this plan is so that we may know and experience the truth of God. If we are in darkness, this means that we are without the light of God. The light represents all that God is, his righteousness, his goodness, his love, his generosity, his grace, his mercy. First John chapter one, verses five through seven says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. See, light has certain qualities such as intensity and direction and color. But darkness is the absence of light and has no quality at all. See, the spiritual light of God is what is real and what is true. If we believe in Jesus, then we have the light of God in our lives. But if we don't believe, then we walk in darkness. Walking in darkness means that you live in such a way that you are that you rarely have any thought about God at all. And if you you do think about him, you don't think of him as light and having no darkness at all. You think of him as some benign uh, person or some good guy who is ready to smile upon you through everything and who is ready to grant you entry into heaven at the end. See, this is a fallacy and it represents walking in darkness. But if you believe and trust in Jesus, then you have the light of God. The third question is, what is the focus of this plan? Now, Jesus said in verses 47 and 48, if anyone hears my words and doesn't keep them, I do not judge him. For I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and doesn't receive my sayings has this as his judge. The word I have spoken will judge him on the last day. And the focus of this plan is reconciliation of all people to a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. See, Jesus did not come to judge us, but to save us. And the word gospel literally means good news. And the gospel message is a story of redemption. We were created in the image of God 
with the ability to choose. And yet we chose to be disobedient. See, Adam and Eve sinned and was separated from God. They chose to do their own thing and not, not be obedient to God. So God had a plan from the very beginning to reconcile our relationship with him through Jesus Christ. You know, if you believe in Jesus, then you believe that there is right and wrong in this world and that the standard we base our morality is on God. It is God that determines what is right and wrong. If you believe in Jesus, then you also believe that there are consequences for our disobedience, for our actions, because that is what he believed and it's what the scripture teaches us. In Romans chapter 3, verses 22 and 24, it says, The righteousness of God is through the faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We do not stand condemned before God because Jesus paid the price for our sin when he died on the cross. We have been justified freely by God's mercy and grace. And this is available to all people. See, that's what it means by no distinction. We, have, we, we just have to believe in Jesus and trust in his plan. The only sin that we will be accountable for at the end is if we reject the words of Jesus. Now, Jesus trusted in this plan, and he gave his life for this plan. And Jesus said this in verses, uh, I think, 49 and 50. He said, I, for I have not spoken on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command to say everything I have said. I know this, that his command is eternal life, so the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. See, this plan is eternal life with God. The plan that Jesus has for you is, a, is special and it, it is good news. So I, I have one more question. Will you take a stand as Jesus did by trusting his heavenly father and say, so will I. See, Jesus trusted his heavenly father. And that's what he wants us to do as well. Now, if you don't believe and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I invite you right now to ask Jesus to come into your life. In fact, let's stop right now and let's pray. Father God, I, just, I, I thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray that if there's anyone here who's struggling with a decision to, to follow you, to say yes to you, I pray that you would give them courage and understanding uh, through, through your, your Holy Spirit, Father. I pray that you would open up their hearts so that they can accept the forgiveness that you offer them. And Father, I pray that you would just um, give them that assurance in their heart right now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you need to talk to anyone about your relationship with Jesus, contact us uh, with the information on the screen and, and, one, and myself or one of our pastors would be more than welcome to speak to you. If, you. if you do believe and you trust in Jesus and want to be a part of something greater than yourself, I invite you to join us in this launch that we are planning for this fall. We need volunteers who desire to make a difference in our community, one person at a time, to help them to know God to find freedom, discover purpose, and to make a difference in our community. At Altitude Church, we believe that if, if you are a believer in God and you participate in the ways of the Lord, that you can participate in communion with us. You do not need to be part of our church. Um, so we welcome you today to take communion with us. As we come to the communion table, let me read to you. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
and if you'll take your bread in, we'll participate in that. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And let us take our cup. Well, God's word is amazing. But in the midst of our challenges and our trials, we often miss what God is trying to say to us in the distractions of the situation we might be in. But when, when we quiet ourselves long enough to seek and listen to what God is trying to tell us, confusion fades, freedom reigns. We can have hope and peace in His promise to keep us safe. Today, as we quiet our hearts and listen, we know we can trust you, Jesus.
Cause everything you say is life to me Oh, I don't want to miss one word you speak So quiet my heart, I'm listening Hey, Altitude Church family. I have got some amazing and massive news to share with you that just goes to show how God is moving in our midst in this season. I'm gonna share more of the full picture on this at a specially called meeting on February 28th at 11.20 a.m. I wanna invite you to join us with that. It's gonna be both in person and online so that everyone has an opportunity to be a part of it. At this meeting, we're going to share the full picture of the four phases that lead up to our September 19th launch, our grand opening into the community. And as of this week, I have some amazing news to share with you. And I promise this has been a God thing all the way through. You see, we voted to merge our two congregations over a year ago. And that vision was to bring the two congregations together and launch a new life-giving church into our community. A part of that was selling both of our facilities in order to find a new epicenter of hope that we could serve from into our community. Probably the biggest question that I've had or that people have asked me each step of this process has been, but where? And up until this week, I didn't have an answer. But God may have just answered that question for us. I am standing right now at 6550 Wadsworth. Over the course of the pandemic, it has had two different owners that have tried to convert it into both a CrossFit gym and a doggy daycare facility. But through an amazing set of events that God seems to have orchestrated, this may just be the new base camp for Altitude Church. And this location checks all of the boxes. This property has a 26,000 square foot facility that not only has space for a vibrant kids ministry, a growing youth ministry, an expansive cafe area, and also a great space to worship, but because of the special circumstances of the last year, it has already had over a million dollars worth of renovations done for us. This facility sits right off of Wadsworth with a McDonald's and a Starbucks basically in our front yard. It has over 170 parking spaces that I can already see filling up, not just on Sundays, but at special community events like our Trunk or Treat. This facility is less than two blocks away from our Arvada campus, meaning we can invest even more deeply in our strategic partnerships with Beyond Home, Save Our Youth and Hope House, and more to see a God-sized impact in our community. Best of all, God opened up an opportunity that we couldn't have otherwise orchestrated for ourselves to begin moving into this new epicenter of hope in time for launch. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I can't wait to share more details with you about this God-sized opportunity. So I want to invite you to join and be a part of the specially called meeting Sunday, February 28th, at 11.20 a.m., both online and in person so that everyone can be a part of it. Look, God is moving in amazing ways in our midst. He's opening up opportunities for us to be bold and walk into this new and exciting vision for our future together. And I can't wait for you to be a part of it. Thanks for joining us today at Altitude Church Online. God is doing some amazing things in our midst, and I know that Jesus is speaking into your life right now. If you'd like to talk to one of our leaders about what it means to follow Jesus or take your next steps with Him, you could reach out to us using the link that's on the screen here below, and one of our leaders will have a conversation with you. If you'd like to support the mission and ministry of Altitude Church, you can do so safely and securely online anytime through the giving link that's on the screen. Your giving makes a huge difference and allows us to do life-changing ministry that makes a real impact in the real lives of real people that God really loves. Hey, we've got some amazing things coming up. We've got a new series starting at the first week of March called This Is The Way. And if you've heard those words lately on some other show or something like that, that's pretty intentional. We're going to be talking about how Jesus described himself as 
the way and what it means to follow him. This is the way. Thanks for joining us again at Altitude Church Online, and we can't wait to see you next week.